Right, now, listen, yeah. now, listen, listen. Uh, I've got to say to my viewers, I'm not talking to Chris here, there's a lot of talk about this bloke becoming leader of the Labor Party in New South Wales after Jodie Mackay's performance in this Berejiklian affair. Now, Chris, can I just say this to you? I want you to have a look at this video. And this is the leader of the opposition in the New South Wales Parliament, Jodie Mackay. Just watch this. You are complicit in your his seat. corruption and his misconduct. You, Why you did you not call. fulfil your legal obligation? Resume Why did you not do seat. that? He told you, you what he was doing. Course. You did not report it. Why? Chris, if people are watching out there, can any reasonable person seriously argue that this is a way a leader should prosecute a case, no matter how powerful or culpable the opposing individual might be? Well, I mean, that's the bear pit, Alan. That's the New South Wales Parliament. It's the toughest parliament in Australia. And that's Jodie McKay asking questions on behalf of but the screeching. taxpayer. Screeching. No, I, no I, don't, I don't accept that. She's not doing that. Look, I mean, we've been asking questions every day of the last two weeks, Jodie in particular. One of the questions was, does the Premier know of any other MPs who've been receiving secret commissions as property lobbyists? And we didn't get an answer. I mean, I think that the Premier by and large has decided that she's above scrutiny, particularly from the New South Wales Parliament. And simple questions like, do you think it's appropriate for one of your MPs to take $10,000 to be introduced to the Premier of New South Wales is appropriate or not? So, look, it's a tough parliament, but that's the Leader of the Opposition's but job Chris, to, to put it on the yeah, Premier's I, chin. Chris, to be honest with you, now listen, both you and the Liberal Party, Labor and the Liberal Party, charge people $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 to attend functions, to, quote, meet the Minister, meet the Premier. It's going on all the time. Now, if that's going to change, so be it. But at the same time, I don't think that can be thrown at Berejiklian's feet. But I want to come to something much more important. Matt Keane thinks he's a potential leader of the Liberal Party. Only a week ago, he had school kids in his office holding placards saying, fund our future, not gas. Photos were taken. They appear, I understand it, in activists' newsletters. Now, the government is backing the Narrabri gas project. This man's the energy minister. Chris Minns, if cabinet solidarity is to mean anything, should this bloke resign? Uh, well, look, he's a funny bloke. I, I'm half expecting to be in a koala suit carrying a bucket soon, uh, soliciting for the Wilderness Society. Look, I... He's a f I don't really understand what kind of game he's on about. It seems like a bit of a pantomime. One minute he's wearing a, a puffer jacket talking about national parks and then with the Warragamba Dam wall he's trying to ruin the same national parks. He criticises the Narrabri gas decision while his own government signs off on the gas deal. He takes a shot at John Barillaro over koalas and then sort of rescinds a couple of weeks later. I think Matt Keane, the Environment Minister, is upset with the Energy Minister, who's also Matt Keane. That's so, uh, well, let me look, ask you this. Let I wouldn't worry this. too much about it, because he by and large seems no, to be on. firing blank. But hang on. I mean, cabinet solidarity must mean something. At the beginning of the year, the Berejiklian government struck a massive $2 billion deal with the federal government. It was signed by Matt Keane to increase gas supply in New South Wales. Wouldn't cabinet solidarity require him to support gas? And not only is he guilty of breaching cabinet solidarity, guilty of indoctrinating school kids with untruths. Well, maybe the school kids were got through to him, Alan. Who knows? We don't know what who, who was who was the bigger impact on the. Well, other. if you were the leader, if you were the leader, what would you do? No, oh, well, he, he's acting like a Labor environment minister. Maybe I'd promote him. Who knows? Look, I think <laughs> the thing about the thing about <laughs> Matt Keane. Don't don't go any further. You've done well. That's a good okay. line. I come to education. What are we to make of the fact that more than a thousand students sitting for the high school certificate exams need help? to read their papers. Yeah, look, I, well, you hear these stories every couple of years about schools, uh, I don't know whether they're gaming the system, but certainly anecdotally that there's a wide-scale program of allowing students extra time to sit challenging yep, papers yep. While, while everyone else in the same year in the same yes. cohort has to abide by the time limits. Look, if it's a legitimate reason, if there's particular but Chris, issues, these are called that's fine. But if it's happening, I've got to say, Alan, if it's happening in a systemic way, then it's not a victimless crime because some other kid is not, uh, who is abiding by the rules is being shortchanged by it. So I'd no, like Chris, to see a Chris, review. If, they, if, they are, if the argument is they're functionally illiterate and therefore they can't read the paper and someone else has got to read it for them, if they're functionally illiterate, how are they sitting for the exam? 
Yeah, you would have thought that would have been dealt with before year 12. Yep. I mean, look, the, the thing here is that we've been saying for the last three decades that we want to be the clever country. We need to invest in education. Yep. When it comes to the latest standardised testing comparing yep. Australia against the rest of the world, we are dropping. Correct. We're three years behind Correct. Singapore when it comes to maths. And if there's wide-scale changes to the time limit available to students and it's happening in a systemic way, then other kids are really being disadvantaged. We've got to look at yep. it. But, I mean, students, we're told, with low-level reading ability qualify for someone to read the paper for them. And last year, 1,167 students. I mean, am I out of step? I mean, if you can't read the exam paper, why are you sitting for the exam? And, Chris, how is it fair for students who work their butt off to gain academic proficiency, but if you're not proficient, you're given a start, given a leg up? Yeah, look, the it's the toughest exam anyone sits. I still have nightmares about the bloody HSC. It's very, very difficult. It, it puts a lot of pressure it on is. kids. But if someone's not getting... If it's not a level playing field... That's it. ..and there's some kids that are getting uh, dudded as a result, right. I'd like to see the government sort of hold a review into this because there's a lot yeah, of anecdotal right. information, but we haven't seen whether it's happening no. on a systemic level, what... Uh, challenges we just keep and being what, told what, it's terrific, it's terrific, everything's terrific. Now, listen, will you stop intimidating the opposition? You've <laughs> frightened him off, you've frightened him off. I hope I'll see Never. both of you next week. Thanks, Thanks for your time. Thank you. There Sorry. he is, Chris Minns.